All right. Well, we still have some people joining um, and that's OK. We're going to allow them to join, you know, as, as the stream continues. But we'll go ahead and get started for the sake of time. Um, so welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning, afternoon, evening. It really depends on where in the world you are, obviously, as right. in the chat. Um, my name is Christina Ulrich, and I'm the Interim Executive Director of Beta Gamma Sigma, and I'm so pleased to be able to join you today as your moderator and host for the webinar. Um, we do want this webinar to be interactive. We want you to walk away with actionable advice and, and answered questions. So in order to deliver on that goal, I just want to start with a few housekeeping items really quickly. So as many of you have already seen, we do have the chat functionality. Um, we also have a Q&A area, which is located on the bottom or the right-hand side of your screen, depending on what device you're on. So please use the chat area to introduce yourself, um, like so many of our members are already doing. You can shout out your BGS chapter. You can let us know where in the world you're calling in from. Um, or you can just generally say hi. So the team will be moderating the chat um, just to make sure that there aren't any questions there. If you do have questions throughout our presentation today, we're gonna ask you to use the Q&A area to make sure that your questions don't get lost. Um, our team will be monitoring the Q&A and I'll actually be moderating some Q&A sections throughout the presentation today at predetermined points. But you can submit your question at any point during the presentation, and we're going to do our best to get through as many of those questions as possible. I want you to be aware that we are recording this live presentation today. Uh, that recording will be available on the Career Central website in the next few days, and we'll have this available on demand for at least the next month if you'd like to revisit the content that you hear today. And after the webinar, you'll also have an opportunity to give us your feedback via a very short Zoom survey. And so we'll thank you in advance for taking a few moments to complete the survey as it'll help us shape kind of our future programming to meet the needs and demands of our membership. Um, I did wanna take just a second to draw some lines between what our relationship is with Cartavera. Um, which is where our presenters are from today. So um, Cartavera is actually a BGS member owned organization and it focuses on leadership development in a virtual environment. Um, BGS officially partnered with Cartavera earlier this year and they've been offering an opportunity to our members to join their Cartavera tribe. Um, they've got lots of great leadership resources on their website as well. And I've personally taken advantage of their monthly digital meetups called Mastermind Mondays. Um, they also have an outstanding podcast um, if you're looking for some professional inspiration. So if you want to learn more about Cartavera, you can, of course, visit our website in the member benefits section, or you can visit their website. You can also visit www.leadershipjunkies.com. Um, <laughs> that's the podcast. <laughs> that's the podcast, which is a personal favorite. We also have some links for that on our website. Um, and one of the really good news uh, pieces is that they're actually going to be providing a special discount for participants on the webinar today. So stay tuned for that, uh, for that discount. Um, I'll just give a very brief intro into our presenters. Um, so Craig Matthews is CEO and visioner of Cartavera. He's an experienced chief technical officer, a revenue architect, and a serial entrepreneur who has led or been a part of seven startups. Um, Craig actually also is the president of our Raleigh-Durham BGS alumni chapter, so we're so happy to be able to have him here with us today. Great to be here. His partner is Jeff Nieschwitz. Um, Jeff is co-founder and chief shift officer of Cartavera. <laughs> Jeff is a speaker, a business coach, a consultant, and an author of four leadership and business books, um, and just has excellent insight. Um, into business coaching. So please join me in welcoming Craig and Jeff. Um, we're very much looking forward to your presentation today. So we will ask Matt to stop sharing his screen to allow you to share your slides. All right, sounds good. Well, welcome everybody. We are so glad to be here. And I love the international nature of what we have. Jeff and I have been very intentional in our podcast to be interviewing people from around the world and lots of different areas as well. So Leadership Junkies is, uh, it's been a lot of fun. We've, we've exceeded our, our first 100 episodes now. So that's, that's pretty exciting as well. So this court or this uh, webinar today on becoming a confident manager is really for two different kinds of people, people who are just looking at 
I want to become that first time manager and also people who are experienced as managers. Yeah, this is, you know, the th interesting thing about managers is, and we'll talk about this a lot today, so much of what we talk about at Cartavera is redefining things like management and leadership, because I feel, like, Craig and I both feel like it, we've lost our way <laughs> in these terms, and we these terms have become almost meaningless. So you may he hear some new descriptions today. One word I will plant with you as we begin this conversation is, what does it mean to be intentional? about your growth. Yeah. Uh, intentional. And we'll talk more about what that means because what we both realize is that in order to grow in your career, sadly, most of you are going to have to take the lead on that. Uh, and in fact, even to frame what that growth looks like with your organization. And so if some of you are waiting for your organization to tell you how to grow, it's time to stop waiting. And you may hear that theme throughout today. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that Jeff and I see is the critical difference between effective managers and leaders is that they have a focus on people. And so therefore the, the training that we go through for becoming a leader is much more about the people skills than the technical skills. And yet, you know, I guess if you look at where, where people are spending the money, where the companies are, are spending the money on training, it's typically around those technical skills. And yet that does not jive with research, which says about 85% of success in business and, and in your career comes from the people skills and your integrity. Well, and in fact, the, the <laughs> you'll probably hear Craig and I both chuckle from time to time. I've done some research, and if you can find this answer, please share it with us. I've tried to find out who came up with the phrase soft skills, yeah, right. because I want to go to their house and do something probably inappropriate, because I think they've done such a disservice to us because we've labeled people skills as soft skills. And I imagine these conversations that happen in organizations of where are we going to invest our, our dollars and our time and our energy and say, well, we're going to invest in hard skills where we think there's an immediate return or we're going to invest in soft skills that we're not as clear on the return. But the reality is the return on soft skills is the only multiplier effect. Hard skills create a return of one to one. Soft skills create the multiplier effect, the ripple effect of that investment of time and dollars. So we're going to be, we're going to be focusing on that a lot today as we talk about that journey from going from performer producer to manager, what is your first management role or the next level, whatever we're going to label it. This is how you, we're going to show you tools to grow wherever, whatever your career is. Yep. And so let's talk about that first piece about how do we position ourselves to be that first time manager? If we're an individual contributor now, and we're trying to move into a position of management, what are the things that we need to really focus on? One, you know, of course, a lot of people say, do your job well. That's one of the things that people get promoted for. And interestingly, though, I, I think a lot of people get promoted for the wrong reasons. Just because you're a great performer in the role that you're in does not mean you're going to be a great performer in the next role. Well, one of the other challenges with that, as we all know, is a lot of organizations don't really define what well means or they limit their definition of it to delivering output in terms of some sort of production, some sort of easily measurable number. And that's, again, one of our challenges because the, the idea of performance tends to focus on easily measurable outcomes, whereas the more important skills, the people skills are more difficult to measure. And therefore, we often don't measure them and don't even include them in our expectations of what doing well means. Yeah. One of the things that Jeff and I would say is when you're, when you're thinking about moving into that management position, start figuring out where you can get those learning opportunities. Because as we learn how to lead people, it, it sometimes can come from volunteer positions, you know, whether it's at uh, your place of worship or a civic opportunity, it can definitely be there. And if you're wanting to do that inside of your normal role, just talk to the people around you and say, hey, I'm, I'm looking to learn some new things, would love to have some new opportunities. 
And really, when you have that kind of attitude of I'm ready to do more, you'll, you'll be surprised at what happens. <laughs> Just a quick aside, I, after spending 11 years in IT management, I went to the CEO of the company I was working for. And I said, Mike, um, I, I need a new challenge. He said, oh, okay, great. Take this software and uh, figure out what you can do with it. Ended up spinning out a whole new company. So that was my, my entrepreneurial start was just because I said, hey, I need a new challenge. Well, and you know, when we're talking about challenges and we've already talked about being intentional and taking the lead on your own growth. And one of the things that's going to be important is to have those conversations early on and that frankly, the earlier better to let those people that have, are in position, supervisors, et cetera, to let them know, number one, that you're interested in stepping up into management, that that's a desire. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the good supervisors are going to ask you questions like why? <laughs> you know, that's a question that's often not answered. People say, well, I want it because isn't that the natural next step? And doesn't that get me a pay raise? One of the challenges we have is we have people who are stepping into management that don't have a real grounded why behind yeah. it. So the first invitation is to get really clear for yourself, what is your why and wanting to be a manager and go to that supervisor and ask for that, first of all, clarity on what it looks like in the organization mm -hmm. and have that supervisor give you feedback, honest feedback of where they see you today relative to those expectations if, you, if and when you want to step into management or the next manager level, whatever that is. And I, we will encourage you to really take a, a hard look at your intentions there, because if you're interested in getting into that management position because you want to help other people around you and you want to be able to have a greater impact, those are great reasons for doing it. If it's because you want to be in charge, <laughs> um, you know, maybe not. If, if it's just about the pay, yeah, maybe there's a technical track that you can go down to. But if you're if you're not really interested in taking care of the people side of things, we encourage you to uh, to do a little bit more work first. And this is a great example of what we said at the beginning of how important it is for you to decide what kind of manager and leader you want to be. Yeah. There's a good chance, depending on your organization, when you go and ask that question of supervisors, the people above you in the in the organization, what does it take? that it's very possible they may not talk about the people skills yeah. because a lot of organizations are not strong in that area. And this is where we have to make a decision point to say, we're going to, I'm just going to follow your lead and I'm going to do what you tell me, or I'm going to choose to be a different kind of leader. Cause here's the question Craig and I have recently realized we've talked about it with podcast guests so infrequently when someone's about to be promoted in an organization, <laughs> Do they ask this question? How good is this person at developing their people? Yeah. And how do you not ask that question when you're talking about someone who's stepping into management of people? But those are the different questions we need to ask. And you may need to define your own path as to what kind of manager you want to be in addition to the feedback you get from your existing organization. Yeah, it's interesting. One of our podcast guests defined it like this. He said, to get promoted, you need to be good technically. But what, what managers are looking at for promotion is that technical competence. But what people who are being led by you are looking at is your character. And so there are different standards that we need to be considering. One of the things that we would suggest doing is really working on your relationship skills. And this means that it's, it comes back to emotional intelligence and really being able to respond not only effectively, but nicely in, in even stressful situations. Um, I've been around some people who just explode in, in certain situations and that's not really helpful. Well, you've all heard the phrase emotional intelligence. Uh, it, it is, seems to be the topic of conversation but we invite you in a lot of our, like, for example, our conf, Be a Confident Manager program course talks about whole other levels, not just emotional intelligence, but yeah. what's our emotional awareness? What's our emotional navigation? What's our um, emotional um, adaptation? Mm -hmm. uh, taking a deep look at triggers and the way that triggers show up and not just turning them off, but understanding and learning from them. 
And I will tell you, uh, many times this may require you to go outside the organization <laughs> to find those growth opportunities because we're finding that many organizations are still delivering, first of all, a lot of hard skills and that what they label as the people skills or the so-called soft skills are still not really getting to the tools you need. Come back to that. the tools you need to be an incredible builder of people because that's what managers do. They help build people up, empower them, and turn them into even better people, performers, contributors, citizens, in fact. Yeah, and I think that's such an important factor. When we look at that one aspect of taking care of your people is the most important thing. Um, it, it really defines the different kind of leader, more of a servant leader rather than a controlling leader. And that's, that's really what Jeff and I talk about a lot on our podcast, as well as in our other trainings. The other thing that you want to do is make sure that you're getting some feedback because we all have blind spots. I mean, we, uh, I've, I've exposed many over the last year. It was very interesting, you know, in, in working with Jeff over the past year. And then also, you know, through the podcast, getting that feedback and saying, oh my gosh, I had no idea that I was thinking this or that I acted this way. And so either having a coach or having somebody that is giving you some feedback from the outside is really, really helpful to you be able, being able to develop the way that you want to. Now, one of the phrases I'm always uh, <laughs> on alert for is when people, and I hear it regularly, both I hear it anecdotally, I hear it from my coaching clients. They'll say, <laughs> you know, the good news is I'm really familiar with all my blind spots. Yeah. And I'll say, well, I think we just found another one. Yeah. We just Absolutely. found a big one because the truth is we become aware of them, but then we, you know, once we get a new, once we get a blind spot out in front of us to work on, another one pops up. That's the nature of growth. And we've got to constantly be scanning and getting, building trust so that we can get that outside feedback that's really rich, sometimes painful, but rich and really helps us grow. Absolutely. So let's take some questions. Uh, Christina, are there any questions that we want to take for positioning yourself for the promotion? So I wanted to share, I know, Jeff, you've been interacting a little bit in the chat, but I wanted to share just some terminology that other people had shared for soft skills. Mm -hmm. So we did have one comment that was just kind of opining that soft skills sounds kind of weak. Yeah. Um, and so Kate actually works in higher ed and she shared that they call soft skills power skills. Ah, nice. I love it. Like, yeah. Um, and then we also had, and I apologize, I think it was Candace shared that they actually use the terminology servant skills. Ooh, I like that. So I like the servant a little bit better just because power can, can mean, you know, it has certain uh, connotations that could be, you know, it's my power over yours or something like that. But um, I definitely better than soft skills. <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted to share those. We do have great conversation going on in the chat. Okay, fantastic. Um, hey, real quick, there is a good question here in the Q&A. There's a question from Avi. How do you identify people who can give you feedback? Uh, I think that's a terrific mm. question. Uh, I, my, my first swat at that, Avi, is to say there's going to be some trial and error. And this is where vulnerability comes into play. My vulnerability is my willingness to ask for feedback from people before I have perfect confidence because it never exists that they really are going to look out for me. They're going to give me helpful feedback. So I would say, ask, be willing to ask everyone and then make discernments about who's going to give you what you consider the best feedback, which to me is the most honest. And here's the other thing to look for in feedback, not just honest, but not about judgments, but about, um, supportive and helpful information. So for example, me saying to you, you're not a good communicator is horrible feedback. <laughs> right. In fact, you might as well not tell me that because it's just a label I've decided. I need to be able to tell you what about your communication is different and mm -hmm. offer you ways to make it different. That's incredible feedback. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go ahead and move on to our next segment, which is all about the mindset shifts that we go into, you know, as we yeah. shift from being an individual contributor into being a manager, there are some pretty significant shifts that happen. First of all is 
going from I'm doing everything to now I'm supporting the doing with, with other things. And so it's not just about doing the work yourself. It's now you're getting some of the work done with other people. Yeah, this is such a big one. And how I know this shows up is so many leaders, when we talk to them about the importance of creating opportunities to empower and grow their people will say, yeah, but you know, the problem is I have a hard time finding time <laughs> to support my people and to encourage my people and get to know my people. I, I have a hard time. They even say to me, Jeff, how do I find time to do that? I say, what else are you doing then? Because that's your job, actually. That's actually your primary job yeah. in a management leadership role. And so the fact that all you have on your list is to do stuff, and that's not all about your people, you've got a fundamental challenge. And that's why we said earlier, you being intentional about the kind of manager and leader you want to be is going to be vital in addition to the feedback you get from inside the organization. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a, another shift is that we're moving from stuff to people. So before, as, as an individual contributor, you're doing these things, you're managing stuff, um, you know, as far as the, the physical goods or the, the reports, the information, things like that. And now when we shift over to handling the people side, and I say handling, I, I really mean caring about and working with the people to not only get the work out of them, but also to grow them. And I think that is a really, really important part because as we are able to grow those people that we are responsible for, they are going to be able to do a better job, but they'll also have a greater desire to follow us because we're taking care of their growth. Well, I love that Craig just used that word um, because it's a word that gets in the way of a lot of change around developing our people. He used the word care or taking care of. And there's a lot of leaders who say, it's not my job to take care of my people. And that can be confusing because what I think they're saying is it's not our job as managers and leaders to caretake our people, hmm. but it absolutely is our responsibility as managers and leaders to take a role of caring for our people. That's how we support our people. One of the best ways we care for our people is giving that, them that really rich, robust feedback. That's a form of caring. And so we, we're struggling in our language a lot today. People say, well, we need more empathy, uh, and, but don't be too empathetic. <laughs> well, that's not possible. It is not possible to be too empathetic it is possible to let your empathy get in the way of the decisions and the communication that needs to happen. But we are at risk when we start saying we need to care less, empathize less. We need just the opposite, folks. Yeah, that's a great point, Jeff. And I think, you know, caretaking versus taking care of or taking care of versus caring for, you know, those the, the terminology is, is interesting, but the main thing is we are looking out for the people that work for us and with us, not only for what they can do for us and what they can do for the organization, but also how can we help them to grow so that they can be better people, you know, whether it's at the office, whether it's at home or wherever, if we can help them to have the better people skills, it makes everybody's life much better. The other thing that we want to look at is that we're shifting then from I'm, I'm looking at people in the general sense to I'm now looking at people very specifically. As we become responsible for other people, we want to make sure that we understand each individual person's goals, motivations, what drives them and where they want to go and be able to help them get there. Yeah, I'm just checking out some questions here. There's some really good questions percolating here. This is in a couple of minutes. We'll we'll hit those questions, folks. There's some really juicy things in there. I like <laughs> I like that word juicy. Um, yeah, and one of the things we need to think about in our role as we're stepping into these 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 mind shifts as we're talking about is understanding the how important it is to understand differences in people. Um, 
you know, we've got so many ranges of differences, including we've got a lot of differences that are the, the topic of conversation throughout the world these days, but we have differences in way of communication, way of listening, of way of learning. And frankly, my view is a lot of managers and leaders just choose to be lazy yeah. and, and almost very self-serving and saying, well, I don't want to learn all these different ways. That's really hard. I just want to communicate my way. And I'm going to do it my way and hope everybody gets it. <laughs> well, that to me is a is you've defaulted in your management and leadership when you choose to think that way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's go ahead and take some of those questions. So, Christina, you want to um, drive that? Yes. So, <clears throat> excuse me. First of all, I'd like to backtrack. You talked a lot about um, or a little about trying to find your why. Why do you want to be a leader? Yeah. Um, and I was wondering if you have any suggestions for steps people can take to start to identify that why. Well, I, I would say ask the question, and that seems obvious, but ask the question and don't trust your first answer. Hmm. Um, you might do it to yourself or have an outsider, you know, facilitate these questions and sort of say, yeah, I hear that, but what's really behind this? And because what I found is typically our first answers are the nice answers. They're the one that <laughs> we expect everyone to hear. It's kind of the interview answer, right? We want to change the world. Yeah. I want to change the world. <laughs> I really care about people. And then they get, and then they get these positions and you go, nothing you're doing every day supports yeah, right. that. So we're asking people to take a real honest look at themselves. So start with the why question and keep digging until I would say till you get to something emotional where you yeah. hit an emotional hit. Now you may have found the real truth of it. And then you're going to have to answer the second question is, am I prepared to do what it takes to be that kind of leader? Because I can yeah. assure you this, being that kind of leader, especially the kind we're talking about, will involve risk. It'll yep. involve more but risk to be these kinds of leaders and managers than to just follow the pattern of everyone else but the reward is worth it. So to Jeff's point about the, the asking why multiple times, I've heard the term, the five whys. So just say, why? Okay, get that answer. Well, why do I want that? Okay, why do I want that? So asking yourself why five, five times, you know, or as Jeff said, until you get to that feeling, what's, what's really under, underlying that? Great. Um, so we've got a lot of questions, um, taking some different angles here, but really the root question is, what do you recommend is maybe the, the most important first step? If you're first stepping into a leadership director, maybe even a business owner role, how do you start taking the steps to foster this type of environment? First, I would start with getting to know your people. That's, that's the most critical part. Just take some time, make sure that you, you block out your schedule, do whatever you need to do, but get to know those people. Sometimes it's helpful to do that in a more socially engaging role. Um, you can do that as a group, but it's also helpful to have the one-on-one -on -one time, maybe take your, your people to lunch or do something where you can spend a little bit of time. Of course, can't necessarily take them to lunch if we're all remote now, but we have the opportunity to spend that time with the people and really just forget about what your agenda is and just listen to them, understand where they're coming from, what their goals are, and how you can help them, help support them in their career, but also in their life. And my answer to that is the first, the first parts of there's two pieces. One's a mind, a mind shift. The other is an, a different way of acting. The mind shift is this, and to, I'm going to simplify it. When we make time for our people, when we listen, when we are empathetic, when we are all the things we're talking about, the message that our people get is that they are seen, heard, valued, Absolutely. cared about that they matter and that they are safe. Yes. That's the fact. That's a fact. When we don't make time for our people, they get the message that I am not seen, not heard, not valued. I don't matter. I'm not cared about and I am not safe. If you can understand those two truths and then make choices from that awareness, you will fundamentally change your behavior. And that gets to the second point is when it comes to what's that behavior look like, focus on extensively, if not exclusively, on your actions. Don't even worry about the right words. 
because the biggest challenge we have is people who talk a good game and don't walk a good game. Mm. And the, this phrase is so vital in this, the, the phrase is decades old, you know, your actions are speaking so loudly, I can't hear you. <laughs> that is the truth of management and leadership. You will be assessed and judged based upon your actions, not your words. And if you have a gap between them, trust is at extreme risk. And I, I'm, I'm getting amped up here because this is so <laughs> vital to remember this. Absolutely. We've got some good questions in here, obviously, from people who are currently managers. Um, yeah. And some of the questions that they're asking are, how do you create or foster a sense of personal responsibility amongst your team members for developing their own soft skills mm. um, or whatever technology we'd like to use? And do you have any actual suggestions, maybe courses, um, books, things like that for helping people to start on their personal growth journey? Yeah. So for that, I'd say, first of all, is just having a, a heart to heart conversation with the person saying, look, you know, I know that you want to progress in your career and you want to go here. Here are some real development areas that I think would help you. And here are some training programs that, that we're willing to pay for or, you know, whatever it is. So there can be some paid things. There can be some unpaid resources, listening to leadership junkies, um, you know, things like that. We also have a how to become a confident leader course, which we'll tell you a little bit more about later. And that's, that's where we go a lot more into things like self-accountability and helping people to take control over their future. Well, and I would add, because it's, you know, to say, what are the resources? There are so many, there's yeah. hundreds or thousands. The couple things I would highlight is this. I would say, beware if your supervisor comes to you and says, we want you to grow, but you're going to need to do it on your own and we're not going to help you at all because that tells me something about the values of the organization. Right. But a couple specific things, Craig mentioned our podcast, a lot of great podcasts, uh, a couple books that are pretty recent that I think would really valuable tools. One is a book called Transfluence hmm. uh, written by Walt Rakowicz, who was a guest on our podcast and a friend of ours. It came out in the fall called Transfluence. It's an incredible book on leading just the way we're talking about through very difficult times. Another book is a book by another guest of ours, Larry English. Hmm, the book yes. is called Remote by Choice, which is about leading and building great culture with a completely remote workforce. I know a lot of the questions were on that. I cannot recommend more. The book and Larry English's podcast, and at a, a break here, I'll throw in the chat a link to that podcast. The other book that actually I'll, I just read a few months ago I love the title and I think it's a great tool uh, because it's so much about that personal responsibility. And the book is called The Buddha and the Badass <laughs> um, by Vizen. Oh, I can't remember his last name. He's the founder of an organization called Mind Valley. And it's a really great book on personal leadership and how the, there's this confluence coming together of these mindsets. And, and badass is not a bad thing. It's being that powerful in a really confident way, but coming from a more grounded place. Fabulous book on that. Yeah. Oh, thank I'm you, Sarah. The, Sarah threw the link in for us. Yeah. Vision like Yummy. Yeah. So we are going to go on to our next uh, topic here just to, for sake of time. I will say that Jeff and I can be available for a half hour after the webinar as well to answer additional questions. And so we do want to make sure that we get to the things that we said that we would cover during this as well, though. So next piece in here is to really talk about the style of management that we look at. Yeah, and let's start with some unfortunate truths here. <laughs> uh, most of you or many of you are maybe familiar with an organization called Gallup. Uh, Gallup is, you know, constantly doing surveys, gathering data about teams and engagement and leadership and management. And in February, they came out with an article and, and the two conclusions that were shocking to me and frightening actually was, but not surprising, unfortunately. They said, first of all, that today, the key managers need to be more coaches than anything else. 
that it's vital for managers to have, learn how to be coaches. And their conclusion, however, is that the degree to which organizations are training their, their managers to be coaches, the word they used was, is dismal. So what that back to that self-empowerment piece of looking for ways to educate yourself, learn yourself, what it means to be a coach, which is going to be things like learning to ask better questions, learning to be more present, working to be um, a better listener. Uh, because coaching, if you think about it, is not, because I'm a coach, this is not about giving advice. It's about listening and asking questions that help people grow through your questions. And if you're not a master at questions, it's time to work on your questioning skills. And there's yep. a lot of resources, but great books on that as well. Yeah, we even had uh, some, I think, a podcast episode on questions, or was that a, maybe that's a training that we can give you access to. I think it's a training. I'll take a yeah. quick look at the podcast. So Jeff, I think one of the key things that you talked about there that we have really dug into a lot, and I've seen your growth in over the last several years, is practicing presence. And to us, that's one of the best, it's, it's really the biggest gift that you can give to anybody is just being present for somebody else. And that means, you know, turning off the distractions, certainly, but really focusing on the other person and giving them your full attention. It means not rolling through things of, okay, what do I have to do next? But really focusing on what the other person is saying. I will say, this is not just for work. This is fantastic for all relationships. This will help to make the other person feel like the most important person in your world at that point. And it is a fantastic thing to learn how to do. Yeah. And, and we could do a whole session. In fact, we have, we <laughs> yeah. have an entire podcast episode on presence. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing is to keep in mind about presence is most of us think we're very present and most of us are not, right. that's the reality. And one of the things we believe falsely about presence is we believe that if we put away our phone, now we're present. But that's not what presence is at all, because presence is about fully being in the moment, not being distracted, not thinking about my phone, not thinking about the emails. And in fact, this is a little tip that hit me just today. I've done it forever. I just didn't realize it was a tip. I'll share it with you. <laughs> one of the things I, I do, I didn't know why I did it. And now I got it. Um, whenever I talk to someone in person or, for example, on a call or a Zoom call, especially where they can see me, I'll have you know a piece of paper with me to write notes on, hmm. like many of us do, and I'll have a writing instrument. Well, I now make it a practice when I'm with someone to have a piece of paper, and I tell them ahead of time, look, the reason I have this paper is maybe you're like this. When I'm talking to people, ideas pop into my head. Things come into my head. But I've used to try and remember them. And when I do that, I'm not really present for you. Hmm. So what happens is when th if things pop in, I'll just write them down so I can be more present for you. Hmm. It does two things. It, it, it keeps me more present, but it communicates to that person, this guy is committed to be present. And, I, and now I go, wow, that would help me too. So we're always looking for these ways that we can find ways to get more present because it is a challenge. We live in a distracted distracting world. And I think one of the things that I think, Jeff, you brought up, you saw some research stating about the, the Zoom fatigue and Jeff uh, and I have not experienced that, but it's because we are used to being present with the other person that we're talking with. And, and with Zoom, you know, you can't really get away from that. And so it's, it's something that's a fantastic thing to practice, just being present for someone else. But also if you are present for yourself in in life, you know, being able to see what's around you and, and experience the joy of life in this moment, it is so much different than, as Jeff would call it, doing some time traveling <laughs> and thinking about what's happening in the past or thinking about what's coming up in the future, but just taking a deep breath and being present in the moment is so helpful. Hey, real quick, Craig, there's a question in here, the yeah. Q&A that I think fits here in this section. Okay. Lou has asked a lot, and this is a really great statement, Lou. He said, a lot of times the best managers are the people who don't want to be a manager. Yes. Because managing people is hard work. He said, ask her views on it. And I would say, I agree with you, Lou. And the reason is because a lot of the people who want to be managers aren't clear on their why or they want it for the wrong yeah. reasons. 
They want to have, they have that sense of, I want to be the boss. I want to be in control. I want to just make more money. Yep. And so there, a lot of times you've got the people who haven't said they want that, but they've got the heart for it. Hmm. And they may, in fact, I, you know, I think you're right on with that. And I look for those people and those are the ones I reach down and say, you know, I'm, I think you can serve well here. Yeah, absolutely. I'm asking well, you to serve. The next piece that we want to talk about is really shifting your calendar. Now, when we talk about this, it is important that we consider where our time goes because you can, you can talk to somebody and say, okay, I can tell what's your priority based on your calendar, you know, where you spend your time. And so if we look at this and we say, okay, people are our number one priority here, but they only get, you know, a couple hours a week, something's off. Well, and what I love about this conversation, Craig, is, uh, and so many people will say, as we said earlier, I'm struggling to find time for this. Well, if you're a manager, first of all, management is your primary responsibility. That's my view of what a manager does. That, that's so, our perspective. It may or may not be your supervisor's perspective. Well, right. But if you look <laughs> at your schedule and you're not spending most of your time in some way connecting with, supporting, empowering people, then I would say we've got a disconnect, right? Yeah. And at a minimum, you now certainly you've got to make a decision. Am I going to just do what I'm told? You know, someone's telling you, hey, you're a manager now, but keep being a doer. And I, I will tell you, I just talked to some people yesterday who are managers and I'm shaking my head when they're telling me how many people are reporting to them. Wow. And they still have doer responsibilities. I said, this model is, this model is, cannot sustain itself. And I'm like, yeah, you know, we're working. I said, well, you work faster. <laughs> There's no way that you have time to do all the doing that's on your plate, as yeah. well as somehow manage 20, 25 people and do that job well. Yeah, that is so true. It, it comes back to, even though people are our top responsibility, we still have stuff to do. You know, there are, there are other things that we have to do, whether that's creating reports, giving information, attending meetings, what, what have you. The nature of the work changes as we become a manager. And really, as you go up in an organization, work gets more complex and we have to solve bigger and bigger problems as that goes along. But if we can really ground ourselves in understanding how to take care of our people, that will make all of the other things so much easier. Because when people trust you, that's when they want to follow you because they know that you have their best interest in mind, not just what you can get out of them. Well, and one of the things to think about here when we're talking about time is literally, and I can't remember the podcast, Craig, a few, probably a month ago now, we had a guest that was talking about leadership systems. Oh yeah. And it struck me as I said, wait a minute, I'm not sure I got this. I'm not sure I'm buying in until they explained it. And it was some talking, telling examples where people in management roles were, I laugh at this, they realized, this was the quote, they realized that leadership was a relationship thing. That was Corey Jenke. Right. And said, well, okay, yeah, the great realization. But then the examples of people saying, that's if that's true, but I don't naturally do that because I have all this do stuff on my list. I need to start building into my schedule the things that are about the people, making time for the people. I'm going to have to block it because I may not do it naturally. Mm -hmm. And that's okay, but are we willing to make the commitment and put those kinds of things in our schedule and make them a priority that we hold those boundaries for our people versus defaulting to the doer responsibilities? That's such a good point, Jeff. I think when we look at where our time goes, some of us are going to be like Jeff and me, we love to be around people. So that's going to be our natural inclination is to schedule some of that time. Some of you may not have that inclination and you're like, gosh, the people side is the toughest part because I don't really like dealing with drama or what have you that's going on in there. <clears throat> but that's where you need to make that commitment of if you're going to be a manager, if you're going to lead, then you need to have that time scheduled for people and that's something that as you do it, you will, you will be able to feel more comfortable and more confident as you do that. And we've used this phrase earlier, you know, we've talked a little bit about feedback, 
feedback is such an, a vital yes. role of us as managers and leaders. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, what I hear often is a manager saying, I know it's important, but I really, I just, I have a hard time finding the time. Well, first of all, that statement alone says to your people and the fact you don't make time that you're really not a priority to me. That's, yeah. I think it's important as a manager to embrace the truth that what you do or say or what you don't do and don't say has an impact on how people see you, whether you want it to or not. And you saying that I wish it was different doesn't change their experience. <laughs> right. What you deliver to your people is their experience. So part of it is, is looking at time differently, but also this understand for yourself, what are those internal hesitancies you have about feedback? Are you hesitant to give it? You're not sure how to do it. You don't receive it well, so you assume no one else will receive it well. Right. You don't want you want to make sure people like you. And a lot of times on feedback, the issue around time for it is really based upon those internal systems and obstacles. And I'll label it resistance I have to the feedback process that fears. causes me not to make time for it. Yeah. And I'd say that's fears as well, because we may have a fear that, oh, well, you know, if I give them this feedback, they're going to stop performing. They're going to start talking about me behind my back. They're not going to like me anymore, whatever those things are. But ultimately, that's your job, you know, to be there to give them feedback. Now, you can give that feedback constructively. And really, the, the shorter time frame you have between check ins, the less time that is for things to blow up and really get out of, out of hand. So if you can do those check-ins, I would suggest that you have a check-in at least on a weekly basis, just to say, hey, um, what is it that you need? How can I support you in what you're doing right now? What resources do you need that you may not have access to? Do you need some training? Do you need, you know, whatever it is. And also not just check in about the work, but just say, you know what, especially in this environment, when, when COVID really came out, Jeff and I were really talking about, you need to check in with your people, find out how they are doing, whether it's physically, whether it's mentally, uh, just making sure that they're okay. And, and part of those check-ins, and there's a, I'll, I'll segue a little bit around the question I saw in the Q&A about, someone was saying, how do you connect with people if you don't enjoy small talk? Mm. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer two reframes to that. One is, it's not the small talk that's the issue. It's whether I care about people or not. Mm -hmm. And if I care about people, then I want to hear their story. Yeah. And I will make time for their story and I'll ask questions to get to know their story. So in fact, I yesterday had a conversation just on this topic. Someone was saying they struggle with remembering people's information, including their name. And I said, well, why do you think that's important to know their name? Is it because you care about people and their name's important or because you know it's the business thing to do? And he went, it's the business thing. <laughs> I said, well, there's your first shift. If you try and do things because it's the business thing to do, you won't be good at it. Yeah. And how far, I'd say, how far a stretch is it? And it shouldn't be a stretch to say, I do care about people because what you don't want to have happen, and I've seen it happen, is a quick story, a number of years ago, I went into a small organization, 20 people, and met one of their people, and they had said, this person's their best writer. So to me, that meant, hey, have you ever thought about writing a book? She proceeds to tell me, not only have I thought about it, I've written a book, I had a, a publisher, I chose not to publish it because I wasn't ready for my story to be told. And we had a great conversation at the end. She said, you know, I've been here three years, and no one here knows that. Wow. I said, how do you go three years and no one asked your best writer if they've ever thought about a book? That tells me you're not curious. That tells me you're not seeing people as people. You're seeing people as a fellow employee, perhaps. But the more we can just see people as a fellow human being and, and be curious. I don't know if we've used that word. Curiosity is vital for someone who wants to step in in management and leadership. Because it means you'll be curious with your questions. You'll be curious in your own growth. You'll be constantly looking to grow yourself. You're going to learn about everything. Curiosity is an incredible skill and mindset for managers and leaders. Absolutely. So, Jeff, are you suggesting that we actually add more humanity to what we're doing, too? 
Um, how about <laughs> that's all we are? How about, yeah, how about right. if we actually realize that the people that work with us and for us are human beings? Wow. Or humanity is the, it is the thing, not just a little bit more of it. Yeah, absolutely. I think when we look at this, we're really talking about relationships in, in all aspects of leadership. It comes back to relationships and we have to decide, are we going to play the short game? I want to win, or are we going to play the long game where everybody wins? And it makes a huge difference. Having, having been married 33 years, when I take that long-term approach, we have a great relationship. When I take that short-term approach, things, things bubble up. <laughs> so let's take some questions here. All right, we have so many good questions. Yes. Um, so we've already started to kind of touch on this topic, but we do have people wondering how they can foster that sort of safe environment, yeah. encouraging people to give feedback. Do you have anything, any other tips to share there? They're talking about the giving of it or the receiving of it because they're similar but different. What I didn't see that question. What is that? It was in the actual chat. And so okay. let's start first with the giving of feedback. Well, the giving of feedback is, first of all, understand this, that giving someone quality feedback is the greatest gift you can give them. Sorry, second greatest. The first second. greatest is full <laughs> yeah. presence. The first, the first gift is full presence. The second greatest gift is feedback because without that, they there is probably a blind spot. They have no opportunity to grow. So number one, instead of seeing it as, oh my God, am I going to do this? This is a gift. Number two, ask Hold on. permission. So you got to be able to tell them that they have spinach in their teeth. But not everybody does. <laughs> Most right. of us acknowledge there are times we haven't done that. We have not done that. So understand that when we hesitate for things like that, like what are they going to think? Are they going to feel uncomfortable? That's about me, not them. Mm, I'm protecting right. myself. That means I care more about me than them. Uh, the second part I would, the other part I would offer is, and I said this earlier, to remember that feedback um, is about, not about a judgment or a label, but something that's an offer of something that could be different or better. And by the way, let's get this straight. Feed, telling someone they did something amazing is also feedback. It's not always you know, an improvement opportunity. And here's a trick that I've started using for six, seven years ago. I encourage you to all start immediately. Even in the workplace, before you offer feedback, ask this question. Mm -hmm. Are you open to feedback? Yeah. And it's because by asking that, it shows respect. It says, I'm only going to do this if you say it's okay. And even my team members, it's okay to say not right now. Maybe they're agitated. Maybe they're busy. Now, I do expect them to be open eventually, but asking that question is a way to build trust and to say, I'm not in a power position with you. Yeah, I'm here collaborating with you so we can grow together. Such a good Are point. Are you open to feedback? Yeah. There are also a lot of good questions in the chat that are centering around how do you give feedback that... Um, might be difficult for someone to hear. So we have various examples, for instance, someone who as a boss thinks their employee might be lazy. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a question here about giving feedback cross generally, generationally, um, if the leader, the person giving feedback is much younger. Than so let's take that first one. Uh, if you think that the person is lazy, what may be an issue is that there's a values misalignment. And so when you look at the values of your organization, of your team, and you're saying, okay, these are the things that we hold to be our, our expectations. This person is not meeting them. So we need to make sure that that person understands what those expectations are. If they decide that they don't want to meet those expectations, they should not be there. If they decide that they want to, but they need some training, they need some other, other guidance, something else, then that's a different issue. And this is where... Jeff, you have the questions. Yeah. So here's what I would say, first of all, to that, Christina, it's telling someone they're lazy is not feedback. Right. It's not. That's one of those generalizations. It's a label. It's a judgment. What about them do I believe is lazy? But here's the secret sauce to feedback. Stop telling people stuff. Use questions 
in the feedback process so that they self-assess yeah. and only offer additional pieces that they didn't identify. So what does lazy mean, for example? Maybe it means, is it about their work schedule? Is it about, tell me what that means. And then ask them questions such as if it means, if I judge it as lazy, which means they come to work late. My question might be, so I want to talk to you about, so tell me how you see the way you're showing up here in terms of your timeliness and be here. And then when they say, well, I'm late sometimes, well, tell me what impact that might be having on the rest of the team. And is it fair that you don't fair? do that and everybody else does? I would say this feedback should be 80% questions and only 20% are the parts I add if they didn't self-identify it. This is also how I see how willing people are willing, how honest people are willing to be about their own performance. Yeah. It's amazing the difference that that makes when you're asking the questions rather than just telling them because people don't want to hear from you. Right. But when you, when you ask them the questions, they're going to really internalize that much, much more. And but I'm going to there is, some folks. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was going to say there is a point though, where if they self-select that they are not willing to do the work that they are getting paid for, they don't need to be there. Right. And I'm a, I do not want to minimize this. I will tell you, feedback is going to continue to be a challenge in our world. And this comes back to another place where vulnerability is critical. We get confused about what does vulnerability mean? What do you mean a more vulnerable manager or leader? It means you're willing to offer that feedback, even if there's a risk that it won't go well. If there's a risk, they will not be open or they're going to reject it or they're going to reject you because of it. I gave someone feedback on a training last night who I would call a peer. And I said to him the same thing. Are you, I said a little different. I said, are you open to an offer about what you did? And he said, I don't know right now if I am. And eventually said, uh, yeah, okay. And I gave it to him and he said, wow, that was a really good piece. And it's not always the answer you get, but he acknowledged someone who's a very senior leadership said, I still have a hard time getting feedback because I don't want to sometimes hear this even better. I wanted to say I did amazing. But a lot of times that even better is the tiniest little tweak that could change everything. So vulnerability, willingness to be vulnerable is part of the ability to give feedback on a, in a consistent way. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, as, as we talk about the feedback, there's, this is one of the elements that we think is so, so important that we do this on a regular basis. Don't ever wait for an annual review. That's about the worst thing you could ever do. Because when you do that, it's basically saying that you don't, you don't care in the process, but then all sorts of things can come up in the, in the meantime. Like I said, if you can get to a weekly schedule, even if it's five minute check-in, that is a way to help the other person understand that you care about them, that you're there for them. You as a servant leader are there to support them. If it takes longer than five minutes, then it takes longer than five minutes. You know, you might want to schedule 15 minutes for a five minute call, just so that if they have some other issues, you can be present for them at that point. If they need more from there, then just say, hey, let's, let's really dig into this. Let's schedule a time where we can talk about this further because I want to be fully present for you and I have these other things going on. Yeah, the, I, yeah. I love the questions on feedback. It's Sorry. challenging. Yes, and I think there's a lot of different ways that that question could go. Uh, there's a lot of nuance to some of these questions in here. Yeah. Um, this is a really good one though from Indira. She asks, um, how would you coach a new manager that might have failed in many of these areas? Um, basically, how do you get a reset if you know you've made a mistake? Well, first of all, you probably haven't given them a clear set of expectations of what you expect from that manager. And just do a reset and just be honest with them. Hey, you know what? I blew it. I didn't give you the tools that you needed to be successful. So let's talk about what the expectations are, what the skills are, and let's find a way to build you up so that you can be successful in this role. Well, and that, another that, piece. I'm sorry, that level of vulnerability is really important to building trust as well. And another piece to that, as I heard the question, Christina, as I read it in there, it sounds like the person is struggling to get that restart because it's sort of being held against them. 
I, I think that's a key part of as managers and leaders to understand that we often label people and they're not changing because we're not letting them change. Mm. They're actually changing, but we don't see the change. And so part of self-awareness, emotional intelligence is realizing if I've, dis- if I've decided that I think someone's lazy, that example earlier, it's very difficult for that person to shift my perspective because I have an innate unconscious desire to be right. So as managers, it's important that you catch yourself and start looking for people getting it right, especially when they're in a mode of trying to to recover or change or get past a mistake they made. And the other thing is, frankly, I'd have to know what the mistake is, but too many organizations, one mistake and you're done in their mind. And that's a, to me, that's a horrible organization. Well, it's, it's an organization that's not going to have any innovation. No. Because ultimately, innovation requires you to take some risks, requires you to, to put yourself out there and try different things and learn from it rather than just say, hey, uh, it's interesting. We had a, uh, let's see, Ricky Schwartz. If you go back to our podcast with Ricky Schwartz, she talks about some really interesting things and they have a failure bow. And this is where, hey, you know what? I did this thing. It's not, it's not like I had the work stuff and I couldn't get the work stuff done. No, I'm trying this new project. I did this thing. I blew it. And then they take a bow, right? Yep. And then other people can ask questions or whatever. Yeah, I've never seen that before. That was incredible. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was great. I want to I want to do failure bows now. Yeah. Wait, you failed, yeah, Jeff? Yeah. Oh, all the time. <laughs> What's well, been five We've minutes? We've done something similar at um, at BGS before. So we, um, the management team, actually sat in on a a workshop, and there was a suggestion that if a conversation is going down a path where you suddenly realize this is going a place that I do not want it to go, this is beyond the intention of the call mm-hmm. or the conversation, then anyone has the ability to say jellyfish, and jellyfish <laughs> is a word. Um, <clears throat> the reason it was jellyfish is because it's such a silly out of the blue word that it sort of had the ability to snap people out of what was yeah. currently happening, kind of just do a reset. So oh, it's beautiful. kind of nice to set, you know, expectations like that. Love it. Um, there's also a really good question in here again, maybe about communication, um, and feedback from Felicia. She says, During the time of so much racial unrest, I'm seeing so many members struggle with connecting to and communicating with their minority employees. What advice do you have for those who might be struggling in this area? Wow, that's a great, uh, that's a fabulous question. And it's a uh, vulnerable question. Uh, We are in very challenging times. And, um, you know, Craig and I have been in this work ourselves and as an organization, Uh, having guests on this to continue this. I would say that to take a really close look, maybe with the help of an outsider, at what is causing that discomfort. Um, And because when you say out, when you say I trouble, I struggle connecting with people different than me. Why is that? And the the truth is there's going to be something in me that's about that. And it may not be what we often perceive, which is I've got an issue with the difference. It may be my own uncertainty of saying, I don't know how to do this because in this work around difference, the biggest, one of the biggest challenges we have today is this belief that we got to get it right. We can't make a mistake. And I will tell you really quick an example that happened to me talk about a failure. About a month ago, I was at an event, a networking event. And I was talking to a person from a very large organization. We were talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. And um, I was talking to this person who I perceived to be a man. Hmm. And in the conversation, it was a great conversation. I said, man, you're such a great dude. And she, with grace, and that's what I really appreciate, with grace said, well, actually, I identify as a woman. And went on to say, I, I, and I said, thank you for that. And I said, and I said, thank you for the grace. That was my mistake because I made an assumption. That's not who I want to be. Um, can you tell me the other ways you identify? And we had a really rich conversation, but it was two parts. One is my willingness to say, 
I didn't go for feeling bad. I didn't start apologize. I apologized once. I didn't beat myself up and she extended me grace. And that combination I think is our path forward. Yeah. A willingness to uh, someone said recently, and I, I love this, my willingness to pause my right to be offended. And if I can do that and we can each do that and have everyone be willing to learn and understand that we're going to make mistakes this, there's a messiness to this. So we can have the dialogue in the messiness. I think that's our way ultimately through this. And I think it, it really makes a difference. If, if people know that you care and that you are genuinely trying, they're, they're generally going to give you much more grace than, than if you just come at it as, you know, you're, you're different and you're people like you, you know, whatever those labels are, they do this thing, right? And ultimately, when we label people, we do it with we we do it with duct tape, not with sticky notes. And so those labels do not come off easily. We want to make sure that we don't label people first of all, but that we really get to know each individual person because just because of the color of their skin or their gender or what have you, doesn't mean that they're that different from you. One, I mean, Jeff and I are both tall, bald, white guys but we are very different in a lot of ways, right? And so understanding that even people that look alike can be very, very different. It, it really takes some of that pressure off and it just comes back to, I care about people. So therefore let's have a conversation. And I'm gonna, th I'm gonna throw a book in here. Um, the friend of mine, a friend of Craig and I just wrote, it's a fabulous book. It's oh, yeah. called The Inclusive Mindset. And, and one of my takeaways from that book, there's so many ideas in there of how to navigate these different conversations. But, but one of them that he talks about is that one of my, I'll just speak for myself, challenges I have in interacting with people who are different from me is because I'm not used to it. <laughs> right. So the best way to solve that is to create more opportunities for interaction with people of difference. And what I love that Justin's question, Justin Jones Fosu, when he goes into a company to work on D, D, E, and I, and the leader says, we want to be more diverse and inclusive. He says, well, how diverse and inclusive is your personal life? Yes. Because if it's not diverse and inclusive, it's probably not going to happen here because all I'm going to see are barriers. And I've been on a journey myself to make my life intentionally, there's that word again, more diverse and inclusive. So I have more experiences that minimizes all these other challenges when I don't have the regular interaction. Yeah, we we have had many people f with uh, expertise in diversity and inclusion on our podcast. I will say that when you look at Justin Jones Fosu and the interview that we had with him, he talked about several different things that he does, and that was one of them. You know, if you don't have diversity in your personal life, if you're not intentional about that, then chances are it's going to be different. At, it's not going to be different at work. But then the other thing that he does personally is he takes six month chunks and he says, okay, for this six months, I'm going to really get to know some, some Muslims who are, you know, in this context, because I don't know about their, their world experience, or I'm going to get to know people from uh, South America and, you know, really start to understand more about them. And so he's really intentional in taking a big block of time and saying, okay, I need to, I want to know more about this type of person. And he'll just ask the person and say, you know what, I'm, I'm interested in learning more about your culture. Are you open to sharing more about that? Any other That's good quest Would juicy like questions in there, Christina? There's a ton of good questions. Yes. Yeah, okay. um, which, any questions or do you want to go back to your slides and say, yeah, some I questions think we're, we just have a little bit more to wrap up and then we can spend the rest okay. of the time in Q and a, if you want to do that. Great. That makes Great. sense. Okay. Please continue. Questions okay. In Q &A. So one of the things that we wanted to talk about also is just clarifying expectations with your supervisor. So it could be that, and this was very intentional, you know, it's typically going to be the old white guy that's, that's there, but Oftentimes, it's just a matter of understanding what their expectations are that may be different from the way that you want to show up as a leader. And this is one of those questions we all have to ask and answer today, I believe, and the more intentionally, the better. What kind of leader and manager do I want to be? Yep. And if you're in an organization that doesn't align, that doesn't mean you have to give up. 
you know, this is where you make a choice of what degree of risk, what degree of vulnerability am I willing to take to try and create change? Uh, it may be, it could be as I might be, because this has been my history to say, I'm going to just step up and lead the way I choose so that I can demonstrate the change. And I think yeah. that's what I recommend so often. And people will say, well, what you're talking about makes sense. I want to lead that way, but the organization doesn't, I don't feel like they support it. Well, do you need their permission to do that? Generally not. It's not about spending money. Start leading that way. Start giving feedback. Start making time for your people. Start asking better questions. And when you start to see the results, people can say, wow, what is, you know, I'm looking at names here. What is Keisha doing? What is Sarah doing? What is Candace doing? What is Matt doing? What are all these people doing it's different? Oh my God, that seems to be working. So I guess one of the things is part of management and leadership is not waiting for permission to lead what you believe is the right way. What's really interesting here is the person that introduced Jeff and me is Dina Labriola. We had her on the podcast, but one of the interesting things there is she's an attorney, but she did not just let things ride. She, she managed her people and she did that well, but then it came time to really understanding, okay, we want more gender diversity or, or uh, racial diversity within the organization. And she took that upon herself to push and push and push to make that happen. So she was leading within the organization, even though she didn't have the role or the position as one of the top leaders to make that happen. Well, and what she did was she kept speaking up saying it was the right thing to do, the right thing to do, and wasn't getting heard. So she shifted her strategy and shifted to the business case. Yeah. And she still believed it was the right thing to do, but she shifted to a business case and that got heard. And so that's that reminder of, you know, we people, the fact that people don't hear us the first time doesn't mean they don't care. Maybe they just didn't hear the message the way they need to hear it. Yeah. And, and that's part of what we do as managers and leaders is reframe that message. Yep. And I'll say, if you, if you see changes that need to be made within the organization, start with what you can control and start building a coalition of other people that can help make some of those changes happen within the organization. It's really important that we not just stay focused on our little insular world, but rather start looking outside. And I highly recommend that you start networking with people throughout your organization if you have a bigger organization and also outside of your organization to understand different roles, different, different types of companies and how different places work as well and get ideas from other leaders so that you can bring those back. Ultimately, there are so many people out there who are doing some good things, whether their overall management is, is great or not, you can usually pick up one good tidbit from, from other people. I think this all comes back to what we started off at the beginning, this idea of you making a decision, not only yeah. about your why of being a manager or leader, but really specific about what kind of manager or leader you want to be. And until you have clarity on that, you're going to tend to follow what's in front of you and you're going to take the easy path. But make no mistake, resistance is real both external and internal. And when you step up to lead differently, you will face obstacles. That's yep. a, but that's what leadership is about. Leadership is about those obstacles. You know, I love, um, I love movies and there's a movie, uh, a league of their own. Mm, yeah. You don't think it's about leadership, but there's this scene where Gina Davis's character is leaving the team and Tom Hanks is the manager. And she said, it just got to be too hard. And he said, the heart is what makes it great. If it was easy, everybody would do it. It's the hard that makes it great. And I always think about that with leadership. Hmm. And part of that leadership is deciding for yourself who you are and who you're going to be as a leader and a manager. Absolutely. And so when we look at that, we'll close with this part, just creating your microculture of awesome. Essentially, you can craft what you want it to look like. If you take an hour or two and, and just maybe go for a walk and think about how do you want your team to work? How do you want life at, at your office or you know, with, with your team to be? Do you want people to be able to share who they are or is it just about business? 
Do you want to be able to have an impact on people? Because ultimately, let's take the bigger picture here. When we have an impact, a positive impact on those who work with us, we help them advance in their careers. We help them have better communication skills, which impacts them at home. Ultimately, we're not just impacting that one person. We're impacting families, possibly generations. And I'm getting chills right now just talking about that because the impact of what we can do as a leader is so big that we oftentimes misunderstand and, and minimize what that impact can be. I, I think and this is a, I, I love this question because it's about the microculture. Uh, Sarah, I was typing her note, but it fits here. She asked this question and says, when you're talking about the organizational culture, how do you lead by example without jeopardizing your position? And Sarah, my answer is you don't, <laughs> you don't. Uh, that's the risk we all face when we choose to lead in a way that aligns for ourselves. There's always a risk and that's the proof that it's the leadership in that decision. And so it's important to take a look at that why you have and determine what your values are and, and then make a decision. And I, for me, and Craig knows this, I look at people and say, I don't, I don't judge people's decisions of how they lead or not. What I do judge is whether they did it very consciously mm -hmm. and they thought through the impact of leading that way or another, because this isn't, I'm not here to tell you how to lead. I'm offering uh, ways to determine what kind of leader you want to be. And then some tools, if you decide to choose a path of really leaning in and taking those risks and being a vulnerable leader. Absolutely. So ultimately, we're going to leave you with a, a thought here, which is, what is your legacy going to be? You know, we have the potential to impact lives. We have the, the potential to make a bigger difference than what we are right now. And when we step into that servant leadership, when we step into really caring about the people that we work with and figuring out ways to help them grow, we are going to not only have a bigger impact, we're going to feel a lot better about what we do and ultimately become a much more confident manager in the process. To continue your journey, we do have a couple other offers that we can uh, that we want to put out there. And that is we have a Becoming a Confident Leader course, which is a lot more depth than what we've covered here in this webinar. Normally it's 497, we're gonna give you 80% off just because I'm a member of BGS and I love BGS members. So that's, that's there. We also have coaching, which is uh, with one of us that will help you to undercover some of those blind spots, help you to really grow as a leader from being able to see some of the things that you don't see right now. And to get access to all of that, it's go.cardevera.com slash confident BGS. And on there, you'll be able to get access to the course, to the coaching, and also we'll, we have the notes and slides there as well. So if you want to get those, you can, all of that's in that one place. I will throw that in the chat. Yep. So at this point, uh, I'll just leave this slide up for a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So Jeff's putting that in the... Yep. In the chat's so good. So let's just dig into questions and thoughts um, so that we can kind of wrap this up and make sure that we're answering as many of the questions as we can from the group. Um, so just to clarify there, um, one of the book and podcast recommendations you had was Remote by Choice and the author was yep. Larry English, correct? Yes, and he was one of our early podcast guests. He has a thousand person consult IT consulting company that started virtually. So it's been around for a long time, well before COVID, and they are 100% virtual, do not have offices, and constantly get culture awards and things like that because it is a culture that feels like family. Jeff actually knows some of the people inside the organization. Yeah, and no, thanks for that question, Christine. I saw some of the notes. I had the book, the book title wrong. The book is called Office Optional. Oh, yeah. And I threw in, the, I did throw in the chat a link to get the book itself. Uh, Larry is phenomenal. And I think one of the things we always love to share about his interview is I asked a lot of guests, what's the secret sauce? How do you do this? And he said, there actually is a secret sauce. And he said, it's two things. Number one, 
leaders starting with me have to model vulnerability. And number two, we invite our people to bring their personal lives to work. We invite it, not just tolerate it, not just make space for it. We invite it. And I thought of how many organizations would be transformed with those two simple, simple, but challenging things. Yeah, that's so interesting. There was actually, speaking of your personal life, there was a question in the Q&A, and I apologize, I can't find her name right now. She was asking, um, what if you're giving feedback to someone who is a, you know, quote unquote, poor performer, and the conversation actually leads itself to the reason why is because the person is struggling with something personally, maybe it's depression or something in their home life. Mm -hmm. How would you approach that as a leader? Ultimately, I think it comes back to, do you care enough to help them work through that? Will you take some of the time to actually support them? Just say, you know what? I don't have solutions for you, but I'm here to support you. Let me make sure that we can get you the help that you need for that, uh, whatever that is. And, and ultimately, can we give some grace? You may need to go to your supervisor and say, you know what? I need to to address this issue, there may be some performance issues for a period of time while we're, while we're getting this taken care of. You may ask the person, first of all, are you okay if I share this with you know, my supervisor so that we can get you the help that you need? Yeah, I, I don't have a whole lot of different comments. I think the key to remember is this, a lot of times we, when that conversation happens, we shut down because we don't know what to do, mm -hmm. um, especially because sometimes people share things. If they really trust you, they're going to share some things that are troubling. The first thing to remember is just stay human. Yeah. Stay human. Yes. Um, and and sec part of that is just hold space for that person. Uh, a lot. Um, here's an offer. Here's an offer I would give to all of your, all your folks. One thing I would say not to say ever is I know how you feel. Oh, because yeah, what absolutely. I have learned on my own journey and from talking to a lot of people is that does not that is a triggering phrase. Because the truth is none of us knows how anyone else feels. We know how I might feel in the same situation. So yeah. typically with that person holding space means saying, I hear you, it sounds like you're really struggling. Thank you for trusting me with that. Right. Uh, right now, I'm just going to listen to you for a while. Mm hmm. And I may say, I don't have a solution, but I'm open to supporting you. Uh, let's talk about what support might look like. Yeah. Because we care about you and let's, let's, we want to support you in this. So use language like that. This is where empathy is so important, but it's not saying, Hey, I know how this is. And one thing you don't say, but it does get said today is uh, some version of, you know, suck it up buttercup. Because hmm. today yeah, there's a the lot of that is happening. And, and, and that is what is, that is too often in organizations gets labeled as drama. And that is not drama. That is people's lives happening. Yeah. I mean, let, let's, let's face it. We had some interesting challenges with COVID. I had a client in the UK who she lost her uncle on Wednesday, her father on Thursday and her mother on Friday. You know, sometimes we just got to give grace to people and say, you know what, I know that you're going through this. Let me see how we can get the rest of the team to help pick up some of the pieces as we're going through this. We will help you get through this as well. Well, so, thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. How about some other I'm questions? Sorry. Yes, so um, Sung Hee actually asked a really good question. How do I know I'm a good manager? What are the indicators? <laughs> Good job. Do people That's want to follow you and ask for that feedback yeah. from them? You know, what can I do better as a manager? My commitment is to be a great manager. I want to be supportive and so forth. Where am I falling down? What, what could I do better? When you get that feedback and they say, wow, you know, you're doing a great job. I really appreciate this, this, and this. You can feel pretty good about it. Well, but you also, and you have to be circumspect to make sure you've built enough trust for that. Because mm, I point. would say this very uh, <laughs> yeah, radically, you don't get to decide if you're a good manager. What you do get to decide is, 
as best as you can tell, are you living in accordance with your values and the intentional path you've chosen as a manager? That you can self-assess, but you need to ask other people because only other people decide if you're a good manager or leader. In fact, this is my bold statement. Your opinion about your management and leadership is irrelevant compared to the rest of the world. Yep. And also know what they're saying because your organization may say, you know what? You're, I've, had, I've had people say this. I'll tell you this. When, when I was in my first job, I, I was criticized for asking too many questions <laughs> about how things were done. And I was also criticized for this. They said, Jeff, why do you spend so much time with the staff? I said, because they're great people. And that's the, that's the moment I knew that I could never stay there long term because wow. that organization saw it as separate. And it's basically that's the us and them. Yeah, they do the work. We don't hang out with them. And that was the moment I said, yeah, this is not my place because that's not that's not my values. Um, thank you for that. Actually, um, there's a great TED talk um, and the name is escaping me now, but one of the biggest takeaways that I had was ask more questions. That's the key to success in pretty much any area of your life. Yes. And I actually have in office um, a poster that just says, ask more questions. It's just a good <laughs> reminder, right. Yourself, right? Be more curious. And that's, you know, um, I think, I, I will say, I think Jeff brings up a really good point there about the work environment. If you're finding that you have a mismatch between your values and the values of the organization, consider a change. There may be a way that you can help that organization change. Uh, sometimes that's an uphill battle that you don't want to fight. And there may be another organization that fits better with your values where you can lead to your full extent. And, you know, just consider those options as well. Well, Kelly actually asked if you have any recommendations, maybe it's books or other resources on um, coaching or what types of questions might be best to ask of your um, team. That Jeff is known as the question guy. <laughs> well, yeah, one of the books and I, I threw it in the chat earlier. Um, let me find this one book here to mention again. Uh, one of the best books I've ever read on questions is by Mara Lee Adams. I'll throw this link in here again. It's called Change Your Questions, Change Your Life. Mm. Uh, John Maxwell has an excellent book as well. It's, it's called Leaders Ask Better Questions or no, Leaders Ask Great Questions. Uh, I don't have that link handy. There's the link for Mara Lee's book. Uh, the thing about questions is this. I think we've got to get better at questions. It's the, it's the one of the most important leadership management tools, but most of us are conditioned to be tellers because telling is easier. There seems easier. It's quicker, takes less work. It's it questions are, are a challenge to learn, but they can be learned. I think it's important to find some canned questions that you use regularly, but here's my mindset. When I engage with people, I am listening for the next question. Let me say that again. I am listening for the next question. So I'm hearing what they're saying, but what I'm listening for is what's the next question that I can ask that will take them deeper or to better self-assess or to understand. What most people say is I'm, I'm listening for what I'm going to say next. Uh, yeah, I'm listening for <laughs> not me. I'm listening for the next question. Yeah, that's great. And, and, and think of questions like this. Uh, this is just a good meta visual for me. I think of it as pulling threads. I'm pulling threads and it's got to be selfless. I ask questions to help people not know what I'm thinking, but so I can understand what they're thinking and they can understand themselves better. That's what coaching questions are about. And we have, we have, as I said, we've got a podcast on questions. I know that we also, a lot of our programs talk about, and in the course, there's a whole section on impact. And in there, we have a series of impact questions that if a manager, to me, if the manager doesn't have those questions, there's a gap. They need those questions in their toolbox. Yep. So you talked earlier, Jeff, about um, <clears throat> sort of laying the groundwork for giving feedback by asking if someone was willing to receive it. Are you um, open to feedback? Yep. Yes. What if, what if someone 
says no. I'm I'm not open to feedback, but it's really feedback that you need to give. How do you approach that conversation? Well, as I said, it's it's and I tell people I set it up, it is perfectly acceptable to say not now. If they say I'm not open to it at all, then that now we're gonna have a conversation. That tells me that I, there's two possibilities. One is you're not open to feedback or you're not open to feedback from me. Now, notice that it could be about our relationship. There's not a trust issue. Um, and I'm going to have that conversation. If ultimately it comes down to someone saying, I just don't really like feedback. Well, to me that right now I, I'm, I'm going to go to, well, thanks for playing that you don't fit here then because that's, that's the kind of question I want to ask in interviews. How open are you to feedback? And everybody says, I, I love feedback. No, you don't. That's, there's very few people I've met. I love feedback and I still struggle receiving it. Uh, and I will tell you that sometimes pain feedback we get is painful. The best feedback I've ever gotten in my life was painful. It was hard to hear. You know, um, it was hard to hear. But that that modeling of a willingness to hear it. But yeah, if someone says they're, ap they're just not open to feedback in general, then, then why are you here? We're here about growing and that's block, that blocks growth. Um, we have an anonymous question that actually talks about um, some of the pitfalls of maybe a first time manager. How do you balance that doing versus managing? Um, maybe even if this is the first time you're leading a team whatsoever. Yeah, ultimately, it's it's about setting your intentions. I would say that you schedule your people time and then let the do time schedule around that. Uh, I will, you know, one little trick that I will say is most people tend to be more productive in the morning, but you might want to check with your people and find out when their most productive time is and protect that time, make that their non-meeting time but that's the time that they can get stuff done. You then schedule your time to connect with them around that. Uh, oftentimes scheduling meetings in the afternoon is more helpful so that people can be fully productive in the morning. And then we have catch up meetings and things in the afternoon. But when you schedule, you know, when you're really looking at your calendar and you're saying, okay, I'm going to check in with my people, you know, maybe it's a day that you do that. Maybe you spread it across the week, whatever works best for you, just schedule that time though, and make sure that you have, the time to be able to say, you know what, I, I genuinely care. I want to hear what's going on in your world. What, what things do you need? What's, what else is going on? And don't just make it about work along the way. Just find out how, how things are going. Again, to, to Jeff's point, that's not always something that people are willing to share until they know that you genuinely do care. And so we have to build some trust in there. But I'll tell you, when you do build the trust, that changes the game for the effectiveness, the productivity, and everything that happens within your team. You're gonna have more fun. You're gonna be able to get things done much faster. People aren't gonna question everything that you ask for because they know your, your overall intent is to help everybody get better. And Christina, I would say if you're a first time manager, that applies if you're truly a first time manager or you're in your next manager role. Yeah. Because now you're a first time manager in that role is to always create converse, intentionally create conversations around expectations from the from your employer, from your supervisor, and what's true for you, because you need to get these things on the table. And many times what happens is you've got your high performers, time they promote them into the next role, which is more of a leadership management role. They don't tell them what to do. They don't tell them what's different because they just sort of expect them to figure it out and these people who are typically doers, that's why they got promoted, come in and say, well, I'm doing as much as before. I'm doing it as well as before. In fact, I'm doing more doing than ever before. What else am I supposed to do? Because they never had a conversation on both sides. They weren't told and they didn't ask for clarity on what the expectation is. Not what am I doing every day? But for example, ask and answer the question, what does great success look like in this role? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And ultimately when we're in a role and we have the ability to craft what that role looks like, we can expand on some of the things that happen in there. For, for example, when I first stepped into a role with one company as an IT manager that grew into being chief technology officer of the company and really having a greater impact over 
the 15 offices that we had rather than just fixing computers and, and stuff like that. So building that team and then helping that team to really be successful by giving them the training, giving them everything that they need to be successful really makes a difference. We have some questions in here about um, operating in a virtual environment, hmm. obviously, since you know, we're all still virtual, most of us anyway. Um, so I'll sort of combine a few questions. Um, basically, some people are looking to make a transition from uh, maybe it's just a day-to-day -day role into a management leadership role. And they're asking if you have advice for what types of responsibilities they should be seeking to take on, show their employer that they're ready for management. Well, one I love that I think very few people think about is um, start mentoring others, not formally, but take a mentoring role, step up and start showing how you develop people around you. That one right there is the one to me, there's always going to be people around you. Are you a person that helps people around you be better? That's what managers do and great team players. It's a combination. So one is I would start doing that. I would start doing mentoring. I would start doing your own growth. If the company's willing to fund it, great. Uh, you know, in a perfect world, get a coach. You know, so, yeah. so few people have coaches. And even in organizations, typically the people who get coaches are the people who are having issues. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I, I just, oh my God, I just, my head explodes. So actually, um, Jeff, to that point, if you don't mind me jumping in here, uh, let's talk about that one issue. You know, we have in a lot of organizations, we have these things called PIPs or performance improvement plans. And one of the issues there is only people who are underperforming will get a PIP, which tells us that we're only going to focus on the people that are underperforming and not on the people who are doing well. What's interesting is Ricky Schwartz, who we'd mentioned earlier, had talked about the research she's done in that area. She said, it's basically throwing good money after bad if you do that. If you really focus on growing your best people, you're going to get many more times the return on that. And so Jeff and I would actually recommend that everybody have a growth plan, not just people who are underperforming. That also allows you to have a different kind of conversation and to have that conversation on an ongoing basis where we're constantly trying to grow people and that's our goal. So now people don't feel singled out. They feel like they're being taken care of. So there are also some questions in here about people who are being promoted to now managing teams that they were previously just a team member of. So how would you recommend approaching that change in relationship mm -hmm. with an existing team where you used to be a coworker um, and now you're their boss? Yeah. Well, first thing I would do is I would reframe your question, Christina, because what you, and I believe in the power of words. What you said is we've got a relationship change. We actually don't. In my opinion, what we have is we have a power differential change. Hmm. We have a positional change. Whether the relationship changes is up to us in the relationship. For example, so many people will say, I can't have, I can't have be friends with people that report to me. That's not true. No. That what the, if you tell me that, what it tells me is that you can't have a friend and still hold boundaries and have honest conversations and do what's right for the organization and for that person. Mm -hmm. This is why empathy is so different than sympathy. <laughs> yeah. When people say I'm too empathetic, no, you're probably too sympathetic and you're letting your sympathies and your emotions drive your decisions versus here's a decision that needs to be made. Excuse me. Here's the accountability that needs to be held, the line that needs to be held. I'm going to do that empathetically, but I'm still going to do it. And, and to remember that, um, is, are those changes challenging? Yes, but they're only as challenging as the relationship is because what's the expectation? I would sit down, by the way, and talk to the other person. If I'm getting the promotion, I would sit down with them and say, look, our positions are going to change here. Um, I feel comfortable that our relationship is good, that we can do this in a good way. Do you have concerns about it? Do you have questions about it? 
here's my concerns. And I, this is where vulnerability comes in. My willingness to say, let's say it's you, Christina. I say, Christina, my concern is that when, uh, that I'm going to hesitate to praise you publicly because I don't want people to think differently. So one of my concerns is I will hesitate. Uh, my other concern is I might be harder on you. I go back to when I was coaching my kids, I was harder on my kids than everybody else. That really wasn't fair, but I wasn't, I didn't catch myself in the time. Have that really honest conversation with that relationship, but understand that the friend, the relationship can stay the same but we still have to do our jobs and, and do what's expected of us, meet expectations. I think one thing that happens is when somebody gets promoted, everybody else expects them to beat them down. You know, oh, they got promoted. So now all those issues that we were having before, they're going to take, take vengeance on me, right? But when you step in and you do nothing but take care of them and build that trust up, it's, it comes back to the actions like Jeff was talking about before. It's not just what we say, it's what we're doing. And when we let those, those issues that have gone on before, you know, maybe there were little petty things happening, let that all go and genuinely start over from a, a position of really wanting to talk to them about where they want to go and being helpful in their growth. <clears throat> That's great. Thank you so much. So I apologize. I am having some internet issues as I'm sure we've all experienced because it's 2021. No. So <laughs> I've asked Matt to step in and be my backup just in case my feed goes down, but we'll take um, just a couple more questions if we can. Um, so we have, a, it looks like a lot of questions about people who are working maybe in the gig economy, maybe they're project workers. Um, and they're just asking about your approach to getting and giving feedback when these aren't necessarily teams that you work with on a regular basis. Mm, yeah. Great idea. Well, to me, it, it doesn't change. Totally. Because agree. I walk through life offering feedback throughout my life. I yeah. offer it to friends. I offer it to acquaintances. I offer it to people I just meet. I, I do. And I, by the way, I always ask permission. Are you open to feedback? Sometimes I'll say, are you open to a question? Because to me, it's a way of staying in my mode of being respectful to those around me. Uh, a lot of people are open. So I think it, we got to be careful that we don't say our, our legal relationship is different. Therefore, somehow the conversation is different. Right. The, the principles are the same. I, wanna, I don't want to be labeling. I don't want to be judging. I want to offer it in a way that's supportive. Um, I want to offer it in a way that's helpful. So much feedback is just not like we, Craig and I were talking the other day. How often do people in a company get given feedback that basically says um, you need to work faster and make fewer mistakes? <laughs> well, thanks for the well, statement. Yeah, thanks, boss. <laughs> what are you talking about? I, I don't know that I perceive that or I, I know I feel that. Can you talk to me and help show me a way? Don't tell me how to do it, but I want to learn and I do want to do better. What's that look like? And if I say figure it out, well, that's not feedback and that's not leadership. And I, I, I want to throw in here also that, I'm, as I said earlier, I'm big on words and I know this covers one of the questions a little bit because someone had said, when do you stop being supportive and kind and switch to being authoritative? And to me, those are two different questions. There's not a switch. I can be hold a boundary while being supportive. I can hold a boundary while being kind. Um, and if the decision has to be made, then I make that decision and I execute it in an empathetic way. One of the things I, I encourage everybody to think about is we tend to think the world is an either or world. <laughs> and one of the keys to living in this world and leading in this world is embrace the, embrace the reality of paradox. I can be empathetic and hold a boundary. I can make a really challenging decision and I can be supportive in it. I can, I can work with friends and I can manage friends. I can do both. It's how I do it that might be a little different. Yeah, I think when we're, we're looking at this, it all comes back to relationship. And as we learn to become, you know, be better communicators, manage our emotional outbursts, um, be able to ask questions and really be present for other people, we're going to find that those relationships get better. 
Now that's going to happen at home. That's going to happen at work. It's wherever you are. If we become better relationship builders, which is a key part of our program, of our course, that's something that, something that really provides so much value for you. Jeff and I, we can build a relationship in an hour that can last for decades and be able to go back to that person and just have a great conversation. It always feels like it's just, it just started from, we just left because we, we genuinely care about the other person and we get to know them well and what drives them. And it's so powerful to be able to do that. Well, we can do that same thing. We can choose to be that way and genuinely care about other people around us. Those relationships, again, don't change, whether it's the gig economy, whether it's a job, whether it's at home, it's all about relationship. And so when we look at the gig economy, I do a lot of work with clients and I'm going to be as open and honest in the feedback with clients as I am with other people, even though they can pull that money from me, ultimately they're paying me for my intellect, for my experience and for my, for my feedback. So I'm going to guide them in the best of my ability. And I may have to tell them that their baby's ugly at times. Uh, Indira also has a, a good question. I think I might know the answer that you'll provide to this, but <laughs> she's uh, when leading a team with a mixture of performance levels. So you have high performers, low performers, mid, um, and basic job ex expectations need to be reiterated. Is it best to provide a blanketed statement or announcement to the whole team to avoid singling people out? Or is it better to have one-on-one -on -one individual conversations with the people who need to be coached? I would say one-on-one -on -one because I'm telling you, this is when I've been in those meetings and you've got this wide group and you, some, are, some are killing it. And then you got your low performers, you got everybody in the middle and the leader or manager gets up and says, you know what, we need to get better at this. Mm -hmm. And if I'm the performer that's doing it, I'm going, why are you telling me that? Right. Because th th to me, I'm going to be blunt because this I'm blunt, but, you know, my, I'm, I'm, bl <laughs> I'm blessed and unfortunate in my career because I get paid to tell people the truth. Yeah, right. And I know that when I tell them the truth, they may fire me, but I'm here to tell the truth. Um, having the blanket conversation to me is cowardly. Um, it's a way I, I'm trying, it's a way to avoid the conversation. And if you've got that many pockets, maybe you got to do a group, but you know, my question is, how did you get to the point and how long have those poor performers been there and how long has it been tolerated, which is a whole nother topic that we have absolutely in-depth coverage in the course about importance of looking at our tolerance factors, what and who are we tolerating? But yeah, to me, those blanket conversations and they diminish the people who are doing well. It diminishes them because, uh, I, you know, I'm not sure. I think this is the phrase that comes to me. And, and 2020 really triggered this even more in our business world. Years ago, my, my one of my sons had learning disabilities. And I found this book by a guy who coaches children through learning disabilities. And he said, one of the challenges is these kids can all perform well in school. The problem is the education system resists treating them differently. Because the education system says treating them differently is not fair. And what he said that stuck with me is when we think that treating everybody, treating people differently is unfair. But he said, what's unfair is treating different people the same. Yeah. And so if someone's performing well, let's, you know, support them, encourage them. If someone's not, we've got to help them get there. And if they can't get there, maybe there needs to be a change. But when we start putting everybody together, they cease to be human beings. Let's talk about the reality here. Everybody knows where the poor performance is, right? They know where the excellent performance is. So all we're doing is being chickens. If we try to put it out there like that, we need to step up and our, you know, have some bravery, have some courage and step up and be the leader that we need to be. And that may mean that in the, in a meeting, if we're going to talk about performance, now this requires a little bit of trust. So we start building that trust. We then help, help them to become self-accountable, which is another thing that we talk about in our program. But the, the big thing is that we wanna make sure that we're celebrating successes along the way. And when we have shortcomings, we ask, how can the rest of the team help you? you know, how can we get better? Because everybody knows what's going on. 
right? And they're going to be grumbling about it and they're going to be talking about it behind everybody's backs. But if we can air that, bring it out a little bit, and again, we, we may need to build a little trust first, but then to be able to have those conversations, the whole team gets better. But we definitely want to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations with people who are underperforming and overperform. Actually, we want to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with everybody, <laughs> right? And being able to help them grow. Well, and I would also say this, be careful of this one too. Often when a leader gets up and says, we need to get better, what people are thinking is, you mean you. Yeah. <laughs> And right. you talk about breaking down trust and culture. Yeah. Um, that's, this is a place, this is an interesting word shift. A lot of people, leaders and managers are saying, you got to use we, 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 we. Not always true. A lot of times yep. leaders and managers have to use I. Yep. And step up and say, I've realized that I'm not doing this job well. I need Absolutely. to get better at this. I know we can all get better, but I've realized that I have shortcomings in this. That's what your team wants to hear. Yeah, that's what fact, you're afraid to say, but that's what your team wants to hear to say, oh, so you get it and you're going to actually work on that with us. Awesome. I'll follow you now. Yeah. So that's where I would encourage you to listen to the podcast with Larry English, who specifically said vulnerability is the shortcut to trust. Yeah. Well, Craig and Jeff, thank you guys so much for taking even extra time today to answer sure. so many questions. Um, we had well over 300 people on the call. And so lots of questions, good conversation in the chat. I'll just remind everyone that a recording of this webinar will be available on Career Central. Um, you can also get in touch with Craig and Jeff. They've both put their emails into the chat. And we'll try to also put together, kind of synthesize a list of some of the resources that we discussed throughout the, pod, or throughout the podcast, your podcast as well, but throughout the webinar today so that people can go back and reference some of those books. Um, so I want to thank everyone for taking some time to be on the call today. Please be on the lookout for new webinars from Beta Gamma Sigma as part of the Career Advantage uh, web series. And I really hope that everyone has a great day. And thank you for hanging in there with me through my internet troubles. <laughs> <laughs> so good to have everybody Thanks here. I love the international nature of BGS and uh, being the president of the Raleigh Durham chapter. I, I have a, a great affinity towards what BGS's mission is. So hope all of you have gotten something out of this and appreciate you being here. Yeah. Thanks for being here. It was uh, a pleasure sharing. Thanks, Christina Thank and you. Matt. Thank you. Everybody have a great day. Great week. Thanks.